once you start to take action, not from the survivor thought, but from the watcher thought, you start to thrive. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on grief and overcoming loss, whether it's loss of our loved ones or loss of parts of ourselves. The latter is actually what we'll focus more on today, what our guest calls invisible losses. Listen on to learn about what invisible losses are, how they keep us stuck in life, and how to move on from these losses to live our most joyful, authentic, and vibrant lives. I'm happy to introduce our our guest, Christina Rasmussen. Christina Rasmussen is an acclaimed grief educator and best-selling author of Second First, Where Did You Go? and Invisible Loss. In 2010, four years after her 35-year-old spouse passed away from stage four colon cancer, she created the life re-entry process, which launched her on a mission to bring compassion, grace, and validation to thousands while simultaneously establishing an exit from what she termed the waiting room. Christina holds a master's degree in guidance and counseling from the University of Durham. She is currently finishing her Master of Fine Arts degree in painting and drawing at the Academy of Art. Her grief work has been featured on ABC News and In Women's World, The Washington Post, and The White House Blog. Hello, Christina. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. And thank you for um, inviting me to have such an important conversation. You know, I'm yes. hoping with the work I'm doing to make these kind of conversations, being vulnerable, kind of the norm, you know, like we are supposed to be witnessed in life and, and to feel good about it, um, to feel good about sharing our deepest, you know, deepest feelings. So thank you for, thank you for having this conversation with me. Yeah. Thank you for being courageous to talk about this, to go where most people are too afraid to go. (laughs) All right. Well, why don't you start by telling us your story? What inspired you to write and teach about grief? You know, destiny is an interesting concept. And I'm going to start by saying um, when I was in my 20s, mid-20s, and I was um, doing my master's in counseling psychology, in the UK at Durham University, Northern England, I wanted to figure out, Eileen, how do people recover from losing the love of their lives, their their partners in life, their brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, best friends. How I love people so much and I couldn't imagine, I could not imagine ever recovering from something like this. And at the time, my professor said, you, <laughs> you're too happy to, to study mm-hmm. such, a, such a topic. And I said, I just, I just need to understand this better. And so I wrote my thesis uh, on the stages of bereavement at the time. What mm-hmm. I didn't know then was that my own very young husband was going to be diagnosed with stage four colon cancer when he was 31 years old. And we had two babies. Um, and Eileen, I was not just devastated. I didn't, I didn't think I could, I could make it through. And I, and I knew all about grief. I knew everything professionally, right? I, uh, mm-hmm. I even facilitated support groups here in, uh, in the U S that we, we moved first to Houston, Texas. That was our first stop. And, um, and I spent time with the dying. I, I volunteered at the hospice and I would go and sit with the dying so their families could go and have a shower. Like I was fascinated by death and how we get through it before anything happened to me. So when the love of my life was told that he had a terminal, it was stage four, a terminal disease, I uh, wished it was me instead of him. I realized that I knew nothing, that my studies were nowhere near enough to understand anything that came to something so tragic. And I promised myself that whenever I made it back to living fully, if, if ever, I would go back and get everyone else who's struggling with the same thing. 
And I always feel emotional when I share this, this part of the story. And it's a long time ago now, but I was determined and it was very hard. Uh, he fought for about uh, three and a half years. We tried everything to save his life and um, he passed away. And I was a single mom uh, running away from my profession. I did not want to um, ever, ever, <laughs> you know, study or be a counselor of grief. I, I, I didn't think I was equipped anymore, right? I didn't think I could, I could, I could do it. I didn't, know, I didn't think I knew anything. Um, and I was grieving deeply. So about four years went by um, and I started to get my life back together. I was working in the corporate world um, and resigned when I was ready. Just literally resigned. Oh, so you took a job completely different from what you studied, in HR. right? Because you're like, I can't, I can't work in this field. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something. And I went, I also went back to school uh, for another postgraduate degree in human resource management at Northeastern University. And um, and I said, I'm. This is what I'm gonna do. I need health insurance for my kids. <laughs> I was in survival mode, right? And we'll talk about that. I, I need this. I need that. I need the other thing. And and. And I was determined, but then I started to feel better. I started to understand things better and resigned and started. And for anyone who's listening, who wants to write or wants to start something and they, they have no idea what they're doing, that's okay. It's, it's exactly what you should be, you should be doing. Um, so I started writing just a few sentences uh, on, on Facebook. Uh, and Facebook was kind of new at the time. Uh, started a page and it just grew so much. It grew so much, so quickly. And then I developed, started to develop the life reentry model, which now it's like 14 years old um, and um. started running classes. We started with 22 people, the very first groups. Um, and our biggest where it was like 250 people from all over the world doing the class with me. Um, I learned so much about um, loss. And that is when around 2014, 15, I started seeing something else beyond tragic grief. And that's when I made my, my first discovery that, um, we don't get stuck or we don't stop living only because we are experiencing something tragic, but there's another loss that's hidden, almost like a phantom loss, like a ghost, something that was completely invisible. And why I named it Invisible Loss. And people got stuck in what I call the waiting room, which is the place we go after something bad happens. And we're not supposed to stay there, Eileen, for a long time. We're supposed to like kind of get better and, 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 and get out of it. But we actually um, stay there for some people for the rest of our lives. And the losses that put us there most people don't realize are something so much smaller, actually very catastrophic, but we don't consider them significant or important and why we are stuck sometimes and we don't know why. So book three, <laughs> and this is the last book I'm ever going to write about grief, by the way. <laughs> uh, this is it. This is the end. This is my, I feel like this. Like a trilogy, right? Of grief. <laughs> <laughs> this is a trilogy. This book the is going to. The end of the trilogy. To, yes. It's going to really, hopefully change the way we look at grief uh, in our world and uh, validate uh, the stories of our lives and, and, and uh, create witnesses for what I call moments of impact, that they're not like tragic, big losses, that they are unacknowledged moments of rejection, being left behind, being isolated, being uh, abandoned by someone. The more public rejection it is, the harder the moment of impact is and the, the longer the stay in the waiting room. So I believe we grieve what I, the way I say it is the original self, the self, Eileen, that we leave behind to, to survive something. We actually doubt ourselves after that moment of impact. We question who we are and we don't believe in our abilities and our skills anymore. So we 
we are too afraid to try something new, to go after our dreams. And that's where a lot of people stay in, in that place in between, thinking that's their new life and kind of accept a second level t- of life. They, they accept a, a less of a life for themselves. Yeah, you're saying like some sort of fear or something is holding them back from from that. Yes. And doubt of doubting them themselves because they were rejected, they were abandoned, they were uh, discarded, uh, whether it's from parents, boyfriends, girlfriends, relationships, your teacher at school. Over the years, over the last 14 years, having witnessed these public cleanses that we do, we do this public within the group where we we share exactly what's on our minds. I witnessed some of the most incredible invisible losses that stem from the public education system. For example, when you are in school, Mm -hmm. in class, in college, in high school, and you feel embarrassed and ashamed for something you don't know or you don't understand. Um, We don't, we don't have nurturing environments. Yeah. Like there's no process to, to help us move through those. All right, let's take a break for today's sponsor, Oak Essentials. Summer is here and I'm excited to share Oak Essentials, clean, luxurious skincare that simplifies your beauty routine. Why splurge on expensive facials when you can achieve that spa quality glow at home? Their moisture rich balm is a standout, enriching your skin with deep hydration and nutrients that boost collagen for a luminous glow. Plus, their Dew Body Oil instantly enhances your skin tone and texture, perfect for your daily body care routine or a day at the beach. Say hello to clean, spa-quality skincare essentials that deliver a moisture-rich glow. My followers will get 15% off their first order, and only this month, they're offering a free, full-sized balancing mist, $44 value, on every first order when you use the code TLL15 at checkout. That's 15% off, plus a $44 gift with your first order at O-A-K-E-S-S. E-N-T-I-A-L-S dot com, promo code T-L-L-15. Go ahead and treat yourself. Get your best skin this summer with Oak Essentials. Okay, before we get to invisible losses, though, I I do want to learn about what led to this. Like, I want to learn what is the life reentry model? Imagine that when something, something happens, a moment of impact, a loss happens, we, we actually not living anymore. And it's like our life is not bad, but it's not good either. Mm -hmm. So the life reentry model is a five-step process that takes you from that in-between place and back to life. And I call it mental stacking. Um, Maybe you've seen this in the book. This process basically helps you stack your thoughts that allows you to um, rewrite the code of, uh, of your life. Um, and it really works. <laughs> it works. What are the five steps for our listeners who don't know this model? So the very first step is, um, is kind of a cleanse. That's what I call it. And I remember doing this, um, in the beginning, not even thinking, not even thinking that I should ever worry that this is, I'm asking everyone to reveal themselves within the group. So imagine, Eileen, if I asked you to share whatever is on your mind and to be as honest as possible, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard step. We live in a world that we hide our true feelings Mm -hmm. because we, we are not rewarded for being honest a lot of the times. So, right. um, so that's, that's the first step and a very important one, uh, without it, without the courage to cleanse those thoughts and write them out or verbally share them. Uh, a lot of my interviews, I actually, uh, <laughs> do this live with the host and I know it's daring, yeah. but <laughs> we start with, I'll give you an example. If I was to share my thoughts right now, I would say something like, um, I, I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm looking inside my mind and sharing with you exactly what's there. And the first thought is, I hope my internet doesn't come go down. And for those who don't know, my power was off and 
And then the second thought that comes in, as I hope Eileen is enjoying this conversation. I hope she feels like um, she's getting something out of this for her awesome listeners. Um, I hope I look good. I hope my mic is good. So I'm giving you a very basic example. And right. Just no filter what's on your mind. No filter. It's just honesty. And yep. in every conversation I'm having, I want everyone to know that it is the best thing we can do for ourselves and our relationship is to actually share what's on our mind. So that's the first layer. So what happens when we write this down and those, when you do the cleanse by yourself, the book has the whole process spelled out. Um, when you do the cleanse by yourself, you can write on a journal for as long as you want and make sure that you're not filtering yourself. Make sure mm -hmm. that you're honest with yourself. Make sure that you're not judging yourself. And um, so, you, so as you saw me say, I hope she's enjoying herself. I hope she's getting something good out of this conversation. If I was to go back, and that's the second step, and find what I call the survivor self, which is the part of our brain that is the fear center. That's the part of you, Eileen, that's keeping you stuck and in the weight room, protecting you from all the monsters outside. <laughs> because basically you've been hurt before. Anyone, if you broke up with your boyfriend, girlfriend, you, you, you've been cheated on, you've had a, a difficult experience, experience, you're afraid to you're afraid to go back out again into, into life. So that survivor self is keeping you stuck and kind of protected. Um, so we're looking to find the words of that in the cleanse. The survivor self. We are yeah. looking to find the mindset of that survival. So I'm going to show you which part of what I just shared with you is the survivor. And I always say to people, it's, it's great that people say, just write things down to release them the answers to all of your questions exist within those words. And if we just write them and close the journal or say them and we don't do anything with what we said, or we don't try to understand what's there, it's an opportunity that's completely wasted. So you go back to the words that I said, and I'm looking for the pattern. That's step number two. What is my fear pattern? What is my, my doubt pattern? What am I saying that is not from my original self, my true self, my right. most authentic right. self. And I don't know if you you caught it what in what I said. Did you catch it? Did you think you could you could find it? I think it's the a lot of them were fear based. Like you're afraid the internet, like this is going to crumble because the internet's going to go down, and you're you're afraid that I might not like the conversation, and that's a fear of like you wanting to please someone else and wanting to you know, be liked. I, I, I get it. Yeah. Yes. So we all have those internal thoughts, those worries. And you're so good at this because you immediately, so my survivor self basically is asking me to check, to make sure that whatever I'm doing is right by you, right? If it was my most wise part of me writing this or saying this, it wouldn't have sounded like this. Right. It would have said, how are you doing? How am I doing in this conversation? It's like going on a date, for example, and going on a first date with someone and all we think about is, am I enough for this person? Yeah. Yeah. Do they like me Ver instead of, do I like them? Am I having fun? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. exactly. Yeah. Like, is this, is this right for me? And we forget that, sur that you're in a survival mode. And, and we have to become mindful of that because it's so easy to go to the place like, gosh, I hope, I hope he likes me. I hope the host of this amazing interview thinks that I'm cr uh, creating great content, right? Also, it should be about, are the listeners getting what they need? Because ultimately that's the mission, right? That's, that's about helping the world. Right. But also, how am I doing? Is this right for me? That's the third step is to reframe that fear. So we take it and say, you know, is this right for you? Is this person right for you? And then we take that thought from that wiser part of us and we put it into action. And without that action, Eileen, um, the system doesn't work. Do you know that a lot of people actually don't realize they're not taking action up until this point? 
it was the most um, incredible thing for me to notice. Uh, people would be doing, we would be in week three, four, and we'd be doing all these things. And then we would come into the action mode place where now that we know what needs to change, we also know what action stems from that going forward. And people would, would struggle to not find the right action, but do it actually take action and do it. So it's not just in our head in theory. So once you start to take action, not from the survivor thought, but from the watcher thought, you start to thrive. And that's the mm. final step where we start to live our lives from that place. And I have seen literally thousands of people change their lives in the course of weeks. And it changes suddenly. It's we go and go and go and do and do and do and say and say and say and change and uh, rewire our minds. And then all of a sudden, once we start gaining momentum into the right direction, and I always say it's not that you climb a mountain. It has to be your mountain. Don't jump and the net will appear. Don't just do without knowing that's the right direction for you because most of us live our life from the place of surviving and we don't even know if the dreams that we have today are the right dreams, Eileen. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love this model and it makes a lot of sense to me because I feel like I love to journal too. So I think I, I do bits and pieces of this, but I love that you made it very step-by-step. Step. Like there's five oh. steps and like the way I summarize it is it's about being honest with yourself of how you're truly feeling and thinking and then recognizing what part is the fear and then what, you know, taking action on the part that's the true, the true self. Like I should be doing this and not protecting myself based on fear. Yes. And most people think they know themselves or think they know what they want, but imagine spending most of your life with the shoulds in your life, like I should be doing this. I should be going to this college. I should be uh, going after this job. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I used to live like that. <laughs> See, the, and I said to myself, she's going to get this because she's experienced that survivor mode until you found the right place. How, how did that feel for you when you, and, and by the way, what helped you you know, find the right place? Because it's such a difficult Thing for most people. I think for me personally, it got to a point where living according to how everyone else wanted me to live, like what I should do and this and that, it just became so painful. Like yes. life was not fun. I, did, I lost the motivation. It just felt so, I don't know what it is, but it was so uncomfortable that I was like, I, there must be a different way. Like there needs to be another way. And that's when I started journaling and really understanding how I felt and what I truly wanted. And I think if you take the time to understand, like to talk to yourself in that voice, you find the true desires within you. And then all it takes is some courage to just go for them. And someone to wit, did you have a friend that also kind of reflected that back to you? Sometimes the right friend can help, but most of us don't have that person. A lot of people feel very lonely in their journeys. I think I felt lonely in my journey. Yes, there were maybe role models that I looked up to, like other mm -hmm. people from social media that I was like, oh, that they're doing something very cool. But I felt like in those times, I felt like I had to go against the wave of society and my peers. I had to kind of fight it in a way. And it did feel lonely for some time because the people around you don't understand. But I think over time, they, they do, like people understand. And, and you realize that everybody feels this way, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I can tell you've been through this path because you just mentioned that some people struggle with your decisions at first. I call that a divergent phase in the model. So basically experience a place where when we start behaving differently than what people are used to us being, uh, we start taking action and doing things we've never done before. Our families and friends start to react. And I want to say to everyone, expect that expect people to say, are you sure you're doing the right thing to question your journey? That's part of just part of it because they are also afraid of losing you and they mm -hmm. have their opinions about what you should be doing, but stick to that path and know that you know best, you know, better than anyone else. 
what is right for yes. you. The pain you've experienced in what I call the waiting room must have been quite something for you to be able to do this because most people feel the pain short term, but then they get comfortable in what they think they should be doing. My loves, time for another short break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. In our hectic lives, maintaining self-care non-negotiables like sleep and meditation is crucial. But when you're feeling overwhelmed or burnt out, then perhaps you could add therapy to that list. BetterHelp is there to support you, helping you stay grounded no matter what life throws your way. Through therapy with BetterHelp, I've gotten better at managing my stress and understanding my burnout cycles. This has taught me the importance of prioritizing self-care to maintain my mental health. Now I'm more mindful about not pushing myself too hard, which has really improved my overall well-being. If you're considering therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And you can always switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash T-L-L. Yeah, some people I, I find can sacrifice their true self for a long time. Like the people that work jobs that they hate for the rest of their life. I don't know where they get that discipline from because I just can't last that long in something that my heart is not in. That's what I learned about myself personally. I, I think everyone has different threshold for, for pain tolerance maybe or, or something like that. Yeah, and also some waiting rooms and survivor selves can be very disorienting. Um, I've, I've uh, worked with people who thought they were in the right place sometimes. Mm -hmm. And someone who is listening, who is also finding themselves in a job that sounds perfect from the outside, sounds great for your parents, sounds great for your friends. Everyone thinks you're, you're it because of it. And we start to believe the hype of that job. We start to believe the hype of what we've accomplished. And we kind of neglect asking ourselves, but am I having fun? Mm -hmm. And I, another discovery I made is that it's not supposed to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so hard. Yeah. And some people, they've been surviving for so long in their life. Their first moments of impact were so early on in life that they, Eileen, they have no one no awareness of the fact that life can be good. They think it's just hard all the time. So they get used to that hardship and they have no idea that actually you can be really happy. It's, it's incredible to see. And um, I experienced a very blissful moment about uh, three years ago now when I went uh, in my spare time as I was writing this book and teaching at the same time, I went back to school. I went to art school to do my MFA in, in art. And that was something I actually didn't think I would ever do, even though I loved to paint so much. I was convinced by people around me. I call that the collective survivor voice. This is the collective. People believe that artists don't make any money. They can't survive on selling art. Uh, it's not a real job, you know, <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. and then of course I had accomplished so much and my work was in helping others. And Eileen, my survivor self told me, how dare I, how dare I consider going to art school? What will people think that I'm abandoning them, that I'm leaving them behind, that I'm not here to help anymore. And I felt guilt and shame. And when when I finally had the courage to say yes to one class, I said, I'm just gonna just gonna apply to school, get in, I'm just gonna do one class. I cried from joy. Oh. Eileen, it was like the whole universe reoriented itself. Like it's almost, and I could also cry about that because I had never, I did not know that feeling before. Because life had been hard for so long. I remember feeling it and, and I knew there was no going back. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. And now I'm going to graduate next year. Amazing. And I don't know how I will be able to do everything, but I know that I know that I will 
I know I'm going to sound dramatic when I say this next part, but I'm going to die as a painter. I know that. No, that's beautiful. I love it. And I I support you so much. (laughs) I think that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you definitely recognize that feeling um, in your own path and, and in the journey that you created. And I don't, we've never met before. I, just read a little bit about you and mm-hmm. um, even from your beautiful website and the way that you describe this pod- podcast about the art of creating mm-hmm. a life or something like that. Yep. I said, that's my girl. I'm like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> she gets yes. it completely. You you know it. How how does it feel for you to wake up every day to, to, to be in this place that you are? First of all, I think it's so empowering and it's, it's a journey. I, I see life as like you have so much, like everything is a choice. I think before you're, when you're stuck in the waiting room, like you said, it doesn't feel like you have a choice in life. It feels like you're stuck and you're, there's all these factors controlling you. But once you realize that you have a choice and you start to act on it and you you truly live the way you want to live, first of all, it's like incredibly fun and fulfilling. And then the second part is it's an ongoing journey where you just learn to get better and better at it right? You, you learn, oh, I have these mindsets still holding me back. Oh, why am I so scared to act on this project? And yes, you're, you're not perfect, right? But you're, you're learning to get better at life. And I see it's like, you're, you're an artist that's like sharpening your skills. You're with practice, you just get better and better. And that's like, yeah, my goal with my brand is like, basically life is an art, make it your masterpiece. And this journey of life is us learning how to be like a masterful artist. Because every artist starts out as an amateur, right? Yes. <laughs> we just, we don't know what we're doing. We're just doodling and try testing colors and testing materials. But over time, you you refine your skills, you you develop like a style and then, and then it's fun, <laughs> right? That's how I see it. And it's mm-hmm. you, right? It's yes. you, it's who you are. I believe in having therapists in our life. Uh, I've had the same therapist for the last nearly three years. And she tells me, she told me the other day, um, when you talk about art, when I talk about art, I'm like, you know, uh, kind of in a different experience. And yeah. if my face changes, my body changes. When I talk about the other work, it's still great, but it's more serious. It's more... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you light up around art. Yes. Yeah. And what I did not know and what a great lesson. And I felt like the universe was saying, we need to teach you this so you can teach that too. Because I said, I say, just say I've, I've had enough homework. <laughs> Please don't <laughs> give me any more homework about learning lessons in life. But it's almost like I did not know that life could be as so good. I did not know that anyone that you, that you can feel happy to wake up every day and and it's been in the last few years, I, so excited to wake up and not feel like, oh my gosh, I have this and that to do. And from all the many students I've had in the last 14 years, one of the things that was very similar was that people felt dread waking up in the morning and didn't feel happy to greet their day. And how sad is that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. I love hearing this about your story and it, it's unexpected, right? I thought we would spend most of our time talking about grief, but then I, I see this, like you said, you're done writing books about grief and it was like the first part of your life was, it, it was heavy, right? But you, you, you learn the skills and you, you basically, w- you're able to move through it. And then I feel like ra- you've entered a part of your life that's so light and, and beautiful. It's my own, my own life reentry. Yeah. And it's the, I think it's because you went through something dark and heavy that you appreciate this part of your life so much more. And I didn't have it. I didn't have art all these years. And I did it. I did it on the side. I even sold some paintings, but it was never at the level that it is now. I mean, yeah, it's, I can't tell you how incredible it is and, and why I'm so passionate about this work because I feel so sad when when I meet people every day, not knowing that their life can be so much better, Eileen, so much mm-hmm. better. And that if we have abandoned that true self, that original self, the part of us that we're here to be, if we're not living by, by that, 
person, that the, that part, then we are grieving that part every day. We are not in in life. We are in in the waiting room. We are surviving. And even I'll tell you, I've seen some um, very intelligent waiting rooms. And I want to say to anyone who's listening, <laughs> who some people are in relationships that are good enough. They're good enough relationships, yeah. but they're not great. They're not mm. because they're afraid maybe to go after those great relationships or they don't know they can be better than that. Yeah. The more intelligent we are, the more intelligent survivor mindset we have. And it's tricky and it sneaks up on us. And I actually didn't think that I was in the waiting room while I was writing books and helping so many people, but there was a part of me a big part of that original self of who I, I was born to be was trapped. Mm. So you could have a great life, but still kind of missing a key ingredient of who you are. And and my goal with the work, with this book, with with every, every person, every podcast, all these people that I'm talking to is that anyone who's listening, even those who are happy, <laughs> I want you to, I want you to, 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 to take the steps and, see which part of your life is in survivor mode and try and change that uh, because you deserve, you deserve the best. You deserve, we're here to experience joy and, and uh, live a life of meaning and purpose. And every day, it's not going to be like you said, perfect. You said it right. It, am I perfect? <laughs> Forget it. I will never be perfect. And I will share my imperfections. And also share the struggle. That's how we yeah. find out where where we are at, what we are missing, what we need, and be honest. We're so like I've been so honest uh, in all these conversations, and and I'm trying to kind of create public spaces of honesty. I created this. Uh, I call it an invisible lost library where people can go anonymously and write. Uh, under 10 words, just so it's quick, uh, what is an invisible loss for them? And so my goal is that one day this digital space will have millions of invisible losses. So every person can go and find that someone else is experiencing something similar to them and feel validated and seen and witnessed. Let's take another quick break. This episode is proudly brought to you by Lola V, the award-winning hair care line founded by Jennifer Aniston. Introducing Lola V, clean, plant-powered products for every hair type and texture. As a special treat for you, enjoy an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolav.com for a limited time. Just use the code LAVENDER at checkout. I've incorporated Lola V's shampoo, conditioner, and glossing detangler into my hair care routine, and my hair is so much healthier and smoother. I appreciate that they use natural plant-based ingredients free from harsh chemicals. Plus, their signature scent that blends citrus, rose, lemongrass, and green tea smells amazing. Unlock Jennifer Aniston approved hair at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code LAVENDER at checkout. That's 15% off your order at lolavie.com with the promo code LAVENDER. Please note that you can only use one promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. Going back to the invisible loss topic, can you share like the most common that you've heard from your students? Maybe like top fives, just so our listeners can understand this concept. Yes, more. And, and and thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that I realized uh, in in this doing these interviews is that it's it is just because I've worked with this for many years and I've created the concept and seen it. And in my community, we talk about invisible loss all the time. It's almost like I'm bringing it out into the world for the first time, like educating mm -hmm. the world of what it is. Invisible yeah. loss is almost like an emotional punch. You know, when you go about your day and your life um, and something happens that's completely unexpected, someone may be insulting you in a, in a meeting at work. Someone saying something to you publicly that doesn't, it's not great and you feel ashamed and you kind of shrivel a little bit yeah. and you don't 
say anything about it to anyone because we've been told not to complain and not to share these seemingly small events because we should be so grateful we have. Look at the great life that we have. You, we hear that all the time. That moment of shame, that moment of embarrassment, and I will give you other examples to that moment of this horrible feeling comes in, you shift the perception of yourself to a person that is not worthy. It is not, you're not good enough. You're not worthy of something better. And the survivor self in your mind, the fear center to, this was all based by the way, uh, by brain, brain science. I brought the whole, the whole thing is, is every step of the way is based on something that our brain does. Your fear center is basically activated in that moment in time and you're worrying and doubting yourself so you can keep yourself small enough never to raise your hand in that meeting again so it doesn't happen again. So you right. become smaller and smaller. And that invisible loss kind of continues and keeps you in that stuck place. So embarrassed at a meeting, at a work meeting, um, let's say you're growing up with a parent, whether it's a mother or a father, that kind of never really looked you in the eye. But you didn't understand that. You just, this is your parent. This is your mother or father, let's say. And they're always dismissive when they talk to you. They move fast. They never kind of stop, sit down and pay attention to you. And that invisible loss, and I've heard different versions of that from early childhood from people, that invisible loss is that you're not worthy of the attention of your parent, that there's no contact, you're not being seen. And then as a child, you don't have the words to uh, express how you feel. You don't know what this is about. You have a strange feeling, but you don't understand it. And then you grow up believing that you're not worthy of that connection with, you're not worthy of love. And you end up, could end up in relationships that you always have to work hard to get that attention. That you, your survivor self will say, am I good enough for them? Am I, what should I do? What should I change? Should I change my hair color? Should I dress differently? Would that be better? And most of those thoughts happen complete, completely unconsciously, actually, unless we're doing the yeah. cleanse and we're right and we're doing the mental stack. There are, the, there's a story in the book I talk about an immigrant um, that moves with her family to the United States and um, she has been raised to be very grateful for the sacrifices her parents have made for her. So she spends her whole life in a career based on what they thought was good for her. Because they yeah. made the sacrifice to come to this country for her education. So she had dedicated her whole life and she had a PhD. She, she was great. She did great. This, this is not about success. It's about the right type of success on the right type of path for you. Um, and her invisible loss was that she couldn't ever tell anyone that she wasn't happy because she should be grateful for the sacrifices her parents had made. There's an exercise in the book. Uh, there's two exercises. One is how to discover your um, early primary invisible loss, something that happened really early on. Um, and another one is to find one that you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, they are different. One is stemming from the other, but they're, they're having different side effects and different experiences. Uh, so I ask you questions like, when was the first time you felt disconnected from the world um, and you felt it was you versus them? When was the first time you felt that you were getting reprimanded for expressing who you are? And we try to locate those memories and because there's a reason why I call it invisible. It's not just invisible to others about us. It's invisible to us, Eileen. Yeah. That's the hardest part. Thank you for giving the examples because it makes it more clear. And then also, I'm sure our listeners can 
they, they can start to understand like the parts of their lives where this might have happened. It's it can be so subtle. It could be someone just saying like a weird comment that came off a little too offensive or critical, or it could be like major childhood trauma. It could be any of those things, right? But the truth is we lose a little bit of ourselves every single time something like that happens. And you're saying that there is a way to get ourselves back. Yes. And that <laughs> that's the beauty. <laughs> and I can't emphasize that not only can we find the places where we lost parts of ourselves, of our true selves, of that original you. There's an exercise in the in the in the book where I call it the Thriver Bridge, where we actually go back. And that's later in the book. We we ha- a good friend of mine, she got an early copy of the book and sent me a text. Christina, you're making me work so hard. I know I need this, but it's a lot of work. And I said, you know, I wish there was another way. I wish there was a shortcut to this, but as you know, I lean for all the work you've done on yourself. If we, if we want to get it right, we got to figure out what we lost, where we lost it, and which way out of the waiting room it is. Because there's mm-hmm. many exit points, but a lot of those exit points actually bring you right back because they're not right. You, you need to really get it right. And I always recommend in the beginning, go slow, do like, do all the exercises, try and try and find those moments of impact and ask yourself the questions, grab it. If you have a friend, if you have a therapist, if you have a friend, if you have a group of people, work with them as well. There's a, in the back of the book, I, um, I'm not, no longer teaching any classes. I just stopped. Um, and I know people assumed that, you know, this will, this book for me is in not replacing the classes, but that's my gift to the world where if you have this book, you can do the work. And at the back, there's a, there's a guide for, uh, for groups as well. So like, I don't need to, I used to, um, trained therapists um, with this model. I believe that the book can absolutely take you by the hand and actually have uh, what I call coffee breaks in the book. (laughs) You can have tea if you want, uh, where it feels like I am with you. I also had my survivor self tell me, how dare I not teach again this work. When you are living from your most authentic self, Eileen, and know you know this very well, the way I was supposed to do my life going forward is never going to be. And people cannot understand the decisions I'm making. They make no sense. <laughs> but for me, it has to be right. Not just right. It has to feel so unbelievable great to say yes to something. And I love teaching. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I love my community. They are the, some of the best people in the world. Like I love teaching this and helping people. There's, there's such a fulfillment. But at the same time, I feel like if I'm living the book, if I'm living the work, if I'm honest with my community and my world around me, if I have to live by example and we teach best when we're living the lesson. This is, this is how people can learn from you is by living the life that not just saying, not just teaching it, not just telling people what to do, but you are living it. And if I'm living mm-hmm. it right, I don't have to teach anything ever again because, because everything is, is, is present that needs to be taught without me having to say much. It's, they, they will, they see it already. I mean, I didn't realize how many people I would inspire by just going back to school. I didn't even tell anyone at the beginning because I was hiding. And I'm like, no, you know, nobody (laughs) should know this, right? And uh, oh my gosh, let's 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 not tell anyone. And then I started telling people, oh my goodness, Eileen, like the way you live your life, like share it as much as much as possible because it's inspiring to so many people. That's how they get to change their life. Yeah, so beautiful like going through this process is a lot of work, right? Where do you recommend people start? Do you start with the easy stuff, like the small losses, or should you just go for the big stuff? Is there an approach? By the way, I had to write this book three different times, and this is not an exaggeration. And it 
trying to explain something that has not been explained before. Um, I thought, of course, it's going to be no problem because I, because I, I am the work I did. I created the work and I've done it for so long. Uh, it was, was difficult because I, I wasn't going to be there. I, everything, the book had to have everything that it needed. I would start, the book will take you gently. So this is the recommendation I, I say, if you, if your brain needs to know what comes next, you can just kind of read through it without doing any of the exercises. If your brain just needs to have an understanding of the landscape, some brains have a need to know what happens next, where we go next before they get there. So do that. My advice would be grab a journal, grab a pen, or if you are, if you're used to writing on your phone, if, whatever is easiest for you, a highlighter and take your time and do those exercises. And it starts with, um, with a questioner, with a few questions and those questions get points that kind of you are being asked the same questions in the end. And you'll see, you actually will see your, your re-entry levels. You, you'll see how much you've changed. For me, just buying the book is not enough. I want everyone to kind of commit to doing the work and to taking their time with it. And then what happens is you will want a family member or a friend to see their own invisible losses. And then you start talking about them to others and then you're changing someone else's life. And, and just even have, even just, you know what, if, if all you can do is just read the first couple of chapters just to have an understanding and just ask your own questions, that's okay too. Don't give yourself a hard time. And if you need to take a break and go back to it, do that as well. When we were doing all the classes, it's always going to be a judgment-free place. It's about learning to be honest with yourself to begin with and asking yourself the tough questions and being, being okay with the answers. It's a complicated process, but it's funny because most people at the end of it, they say, gosh, this is so simple. It's almost natural because we are actually kind of made to get back up again and reenter life. We're made to find a way out of the stuckness and the loop that we're in. We have the abilities and skills. And at the end of the day, all I want people to do is spend only 10 to 15 minutes a day doing a mental stack. The homework kind of shrinks as you go forward. And it's just a stack of thoughts that you are putting yourself back in control of your mind. Imagine if you took 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes a day, you can change your whole entire life. That's all. That's all you need. You don't need any pills. You don't need any, you know, and I'm, I have no people, prescription medication can save lives, but Imagine if you just gave 10, 15 minutes a day. Yeah. It can change so many. And it does. It changes everything. Yeah. yeah. Like, don't feel like you have to do it all at once. It really is like a little bit of day, a little bit of, like, you know, acknowledging honesty, working through it, no, recognizing that, that survivor fear yes. thoughts, right? And then choosing the other option, choosing the, the option that reflects you. And the thriver self, that kid-like self that we've abandoned and left back. There's three narrators. And at the end of the book, we actually integrate them. It's the last, the last phase is the integration phase. We can never, I tell people, we used to do this exercise where I would ask people, uh, we're going to spend five minutes talking, but your survivor self is not going to be here. You need to send your survivor self away. Where would you send that part of you? And it was the biggest surprise. Like, I want you to imagine I had, I did a 20 city uh, book tour. I had workshops, I had classes. I've met a lot of people in different settings, asking them that one question. 80 to 90% of the answer was, I want my survivor self to go to a tropical island and have a cocktail and rest because we love yeah. our survivor selves. Because that part of us has protected us from the pain and loss of those moments of impact. So we are naturally taking care of our survivor self. So it's a complicated relationship. Right. You can't erase it. It's a part of you. And, and you have to appreciate that part of you. Yes. And know that they can't be in charge unless there's a bear waiting for you outside of your house and you're re in real danger. That's the only time. 
then protect, hide, lock the house. <laughs> but otherwise, most most fears are not real fears. Love it. All right, Christina, we have time for one final message. If you were to leave the listeners with any message, whether it's a takeaway or, or, or something, what would that be? Be true to yourself um, and make sure that your dreams are not outdated. And find out which parts you left behind and grab them and take them with you. Your life deserves the very best. And if I could do it, <laughs> if I link and do it, I know you can do it. I know. And I, if you never hear my voice again, um, you never, you never even buy the book or do anything. Just, just spend some time with yourself and figure out what is invisible and what's been hidden even from you. That's the number one steps and step. And I hope you ask that question. Beautiful. All right, Christina, where can we find you online? Christina Um and find Invisible Loss book. Just Google Invisible Loss book, go on Amazon, Invisible Loss. It's everywhere. If you wanted to put your um, Invisible Loss up somewhere anonymously, go to InvisibleLosses.com. I think if there was one action for people to take is to grab that book. I write a, a weekly blog. I I used to have, a, I, I've done a lot of things, but the one task I would want everyone to do is just to, to go, go and look for Invisible Loss. Yeah. Check out the book. We'll definitely link it below. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing today. This was such a joy. You know, I, I, I came into it thinking it would be like a very heavy <laughs> conversation and then it just ended. So, it, 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 everything just flowed and it's, you are such a beautiful light. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And, and also, um, thank you for knowing the work before you, before like your understanding of how everything works. It's, it's incredible. And, uh, thank you for inspiring yeah. so many people to live their best lives. It's amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.